weren't we? We've been blessed this whole weekend through his ministry. On yesterday, on yesterday, amen, uh, the um, uh, class that he taught on yesterday was just, just it should, it was taught, it's a class that every leader across the country should have heard. It was just awesome. And then this message this morning, uh, the difference in, in, in distinguishing between declaring something and decreeing it. You don't have to hesitate uh, to decree for your life. What a powerful word we heard this morning. Man, preached out of the abundance of his heart. He's come back to share with us again tonight, so I'm going to ask all of us who are sitting if we will stand uh, and welcome again uh, to this podium uh, the Honorable Bishop G. Emerson Scott. Put your hands together and give God praise for it. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Not just with your mouth, but with your That doesn't sound like a praise. doesn't sound like a praise I know you're trying to figure out what's going on with this I'm gonna do a little different preaching tonight there you go now just make sure it don't fall on me I'm gonna do a little different teaching preaching tonight um and I hope you don't mind are you all right with that all right how about this side you all right with that Amen. and um it's just it's in my heart um i came in this morning you you can be seated while they get this together they're gonna figure it out i promise it's three of them i know they got to figure it out um when i walked in this morning bishop i walked in um yesterday actually and there were several things I began to feel in my heart. I haven't been here in a year. I haven't spoken to anybody. No one's talked to me. Everything I've heard and everything I have felt, I am absolutely, and without fear of contradiction, of contradiction of the thought, that everything I've heard and felt, I've heard and felt from the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I've, I have... Um, when I came in yesterday, I stood uh, for a while before the session be began um, because of the rain, people gathered slow. But as I was standing there, I was in prayer and there were certain things the Holy Spirit just began to speak to me. I came in this morning and when I took place in the, um, in the office waiting for um, the opportunity to come forward I just began to feel like I was suffocating like I I couldn't breathe like there was something working against my ability just to move forward and I when when Bishop walked in this morning I was on my face I was on my face in prayer because I only know one way uh, how to push through let me talk to this side. I only know one way to push through. Um, and, uh, and the one thing I've learned how to do is, um, is I've learned how to pray. <laughs> and, and while on, on my knees, I, I felt, uh, and on my face, the um, suffocation I felt wasn't mine. And uh, the difficulty to breathe wasn't mine. And uh, the hardship that I began to feel even when I came into the sanctuary. If you remember, I approached the, the sacred desk with tears in my eyes because I felt hearts, heavy hearts, broken hearts. I felt, um, I felt a brokenness. I could feel, Bishop, I don't want anybody to take offense to what I'm saying. Um, after all, I can't do nothing about how you feel. But I, I literally felt people barely hanging on by threads. 
broken hearts and disappointment and my heart began to bleed inside my pain increased because I recognize I recognize a spirit that's at work and so I began to I began to labor in prayer and when I stood up I didn't intend to stand up and cry I didn't intend to stand up and start praying as I prayed um, but I'm a yielded vessel and I can only do what I am led to do uh, and sometimes being led has gotten me in trouble with people and there are a lot of pastors that have not invited me back places because I was led <laughs> and it's okay I I'd rather be led by the Holy Ghost than, uh, than uh, have appointments in places where people don't believe in the Holy Ghost and so um, uh, I prayed about what to preach this evening and decided that preaching wasn't going to happen at all. I don't know if the gentleman, if y'all can see that. Can y'all see that? You're good? Yeah? No? I won't know if you don't talk. Yes, all right. And so the spirit of apathy, breaking the spirit of apathy, which is a spirit that grips not just church, but it grips people, life, whether it is teachers, financial bankers, or it doesn't matter what the walk of life, it doesn't matter the business, it doesn't matter the organization or the entity. That for many people, what they feel is depression is oftentimes not depression, it's apathy. And one of the things that the church has to do is be very careful about yielding to this spirit called apathy. Now, the problem is that most people in church are apathetic about apathy. Uh, we, we have no feeling to do anything about the feeling of not doing anything. You'll catch that on the way home. I said I wasn't going to preach, but I said I'm going to do something like it. Um, Ebony, you helped me out tonight. You were, you, I meant to say this earlier, you were singing in the key of heaven. You was way up there. I, I told Pastor Hatch, all I can do is think to sing that high. <laughs> you was way up there. You helped me out tonight. I need your voice. Got it? Um, but, but the spirit of apathy, most people don't believe, is something that affects the church. And if you don't believe that, then you've never read Revelations chapter 3. When the Lord talks to the church of Laodicea, and he says to the church of Laodicea, I wish you were one or the other, hot or cold. <laughs> I know your works. And the state and the condition that you're in is the state and condition that would cause me to spew you out of my mouth. And that hot nor cold condition, that lukewarm condition is used in today's vernacular among our modernists as the whatever kind of spirit. You know, the whatever. Well, we need to go, whatever. And man, God said we need to do whatever. Wrong side. And say we need to pray whatever <laughs> and said if we don't show up tonight we're gonna be dismissed from our leadership position <laughs> whatever <laughs> the modernists have that kind of mindset and spirit and we don't know just how dangerous the spirit of the, the spirit of apathy is in fact if you read the bible jesus says that apathy is more dangerous than enmity and to have enmity is to be the enemy of god it is more dangerous to have apathy than to be the enemy of God. God help me. God help me. It's dangerous. I, I need you to hear me. So how is that more dangerous? It, it would be more dangerous to be the enemy of God. But the enemy of God knows his position. He ain't fronting. And the enemy of God is not trying to take the assignment of God and do nothing with it. It's when the children of God have the assignment of God but do nothing with the assignment that's given. And so God says it's better to make a vow and keep it or to not make one at all than to break it. So enmity is not as bad as apathy. Enmity says, you have, listen, apathy says I have a responsibility but I'm not committed to it and don't really care about what happens with it. Enmity says I ain't trying, I don't fear you, I'm kind of hostile and mad at you anyway. Nobody talks. <laughs> Okay. And so Laodicea was the church that he said, I can't take the condition that you're in. 
I can't take it. Look at the person next to you and tell him the Lord can't take it. He can't take that. He said, not I, that it is of the condition that would make me spew you out of my mouth. Literally, it would make me regurgitate. I could judge the person who has enmity and be done. But to those who are supposed to be mine, to be apathetic, makes me sick to my stomach. I don't care about the one that ain't mine. He already made his decision. He ain't mine. But you who belong to me, it, it hurts my heart to know that you don't care about what I care about. You say, oh, come on, man. I didn't come to church for you to get down on me. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. And so here's how I need you to understand apathy. What does the first line say? That it, it is the glove into which evil slips its eager hand. That if we're not careful, evil will find itself in place, in position, in power, and in, and in influence because people are apathetic. Now let's find out what that really means. Uh, let's find out what that really means. Uh, let's find out what that really means. Okay, I got it. I didn't have it on. That's all right. I got it now. Now we can find out what that really means. <laughs> Maybe not yet. Now. <laughs> Turn the thing on. All right. <laughs> I want them to see it. Kind of like see it. Kind of like. Kind of like see it. Like see it. Bam. <laughs> now it wants to skip. All right. What is enmity? It is the absence or the suppression of passion, emotion, or excitement. What is it? Now, we would think that we're not void of excitement and or passion or emotion because you say clap your hands and it's easy. We can all go and clap. Come on and shout. Yeah, and we can get a shout in. Come on and dance and we'll all get a dance in. Even if we have to be told 20 times to do it. Okay, wrong side. I got to push you, prime you to do what ought to be natural in you, especially since you were created to do it. I got to fuss at your pastor have to fuss this morning he spent I don't know how many minutes I know how many minutes I ain't just gonna I'm not gonna say how many minutes but he spent minutes talking about how we need to be in church why would a pastor have to tell a Christian he needs or she needs to be in church why why would someone have to tell us to pray why would someone have to tell us to fast it's because we've lost the passion for it. We've lost the excitement. I don't care if you dance. The right music will make anybody dance. Watch. If we put on some Beyonce tonight. I forgot. This is Pentecostal church. Y'all saved. <laughs> Y'all saved at church. But if we put on some Beyonce. <laughs> if we put on Beyonce tonight, somebody going to dance. No, not you. You are that generation. You like Frankie Beverly and Mays. This day to go. I know. See, I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Put on the right music and any of us will dance. We've just learned and we have choreographed how to praise when it comes to church. And it's not necessarily many times out of a passion or an excitement. Most times it's because somebody pushed us to do it. Or because we're rhythmic and we automatically give in to music. So don't confuse the ability to clap your hands and or dance with being excited or having passion. Often cases, it's the absence or the suppression of passion, emotion, excitement. Number two, what is it? It's the lack of interest in or concern for things that others find moving or exciting. I'm, I'm apathetic about it. Let's say it's your birthday. What's your name, man? You got Baron? Uh, I keep looking at you for two days, Baron. Baron, you all right with me? I like your tie. I'm in the collecting business. You can take it off tonight. <laughs> Baron could be shouting about the fact that it's his birthday. 
And you know my posture, he excited, he getting ready, he got the party set, he got the chips and the dip at the house, the music is ready, and boy, it's how the DJ, I know you say, we got a DJ waiting at the house to get the party on, and my mind is, I might show up. I might come. You're invited to my party, and the best you have is, I might show up. I'm moved by this because God's given me another year. God's given me another month. God's given me another experience to live, and, and, and all you got for me is, I might come. I thought enough of you to invite you. Let me go back to this side. And you have no interest for this thing that's special to me. I just got a promotion. And don't nobody care. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's a hard pill to swallow. Number three. Apathy is stoicism. Now what is stoicism? Stoicism is a philosophy where virtue is the highest good based on knowledge. And the wise live in harmony with fate that governs nature void of emotions and feelings. In other words, it is again, it is what it is. Do you remember the uh, Acts chapter 17 on the Mars Hill, Ariochobus, where the saints would gather to discuss new gods? And there they dealt with the whole idiom, eat, drink, and be merry. Okay, come on, eat, drink, and be merry. That, that is a stoic philosophy where nothing else in life matters so let's just live to be happy after all God is not really God and he can't judge us that's stoic philosophy and if God can't judge us he can't judge us because he's equal to us which means we govern our own life we in charge of our own fate that's stoicism believe it or not that has become the attitude of the church we don't live like God judge us wow. let me talk to this side we don't even act like God see us Touch your neighbor, touch your neighbor, say, I know you say, say I know you say, and, and, but, but we act like God don't see us. We act like he don't see us, we act like he don't know us, we act like that our, whatever our secrets are from everybody else is a secret from God. And that is the same as a person who doesn't even believe there is a God. I want you to understand, apathy is a dangerous spirit. Number four, now while we understand that the general definition of apathy, uh, the general definition of apathy is the absence, suppression of passion, emotion, excitement. The truth is that it's really the ap not just the absence of passion, but it's misplaced passion and misplaced or replaced passion. Because while you may not have the energy and the excitement to do what you should, you do have energy to do what you want to. Let me talk to this side. <laughs> like going to church but I will go to a movie wow. let me talk to this guy I don't feel like praying but I, I y'all come on talk. I don't feel like getting dressed to go back to church but invite me to the beach and it's on <laughs> like Donkey Kong <laughs> that's old that's way way back there not too old yeah that's I've been pastoring 31 years not preaching I've been pastoring 31 years and the number of times I've seen this and witnessed this goes without, I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how the church today, this age, is plagued with such a spirit. So we think that times have changed, generations have changed, that what we see among the generation is a lack of commitment. We call them the millennials. The millennials, that's, that's, not, their, that's not their issue. Their issue is they're apathetic toward what we call religion. They don't have the feeling or the passion you and I have and the commitment that you and I have. Now, they love God. They do. But they love God based on their terms and their time. Yeah. It's what works for me. That's what works. Wrong side. <laughs> it's what works for me. Now, I'm here. I'm going to get it in. When I'm done, I'm gone. I ain't got time to play with y'all. I deal with people all day at work because they're your professionals. And I ain't got time to be playing with y'all. If y'all can't get it, then... <laughs> <laughs> okay all right <laughs> okay so what is this thing 
What is this thing? I think I've been pushing the button. Here it is. What is this thing? I want you to understand the danger. 2 Timothy. Let's read it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 4. What does it say? Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh. For themselves, teachers, to suit their own passions. Pause right here. So new philosophies, new thoughts, new ideas, new age thinking says, like the Stoics, there is no God. He can't judge us. There's just a higher power and energy that we need to connect to. Okay, y'all act like you never heard it. There is no God. There's just a higher power we need to connect to. And the church, we still call him God. But we act like he's just the power to connect to when we need something. And so we don't want anybody today. It, listen, it is not popular to preach holiness. Let me talk to this side. It don't take all that. It don't take all that. Because God know me. And God know my propensities. God know what I need to make it. You understand me? So me and God is all right. You and God need to be all right. <laughs> That's the mindset. So to preach commitment, to preach tithe, that's unpopular teaching and preaching. Because you're asking me to commit something more than I'm willing to commit. That's why you got to keep asking me. (laughs) Truth is, I don't want to do it. I'm only doing it because you're making me do it. And the reason people are not really seeing the benefit of these principles is because they're made to do it. God wants you to do it out of the goodness of your heart as a result of the grace you've experienced from him he wants you to respond to him in that grace I don't want to make you do nothing I need you to look down your row and tell him God don't want to make you do nothing he don't make you do nothing if he did then that would be the absence of the exercise of free will and God would much rather you worship him freely than to worship him legally And so then we have teachers for our own ears and we'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander into fables. Fables is the word mythos. And I want you to get this word. The word mythos is, watch this, an invention, a falsehood. In other words, that which appeals to my appetite but does not produce satisfaction. What is a, what is a mythos? It's a fable. Meaning... I'm, I, I don't want the truth of God. Just give me something to make me feel good. Now, I like the boy, so don't nobody get me wrong. Don't be tweeting on Facebook and Twitter and all that other stuff that I said something I'm about to say. Get it right if you're going to quote me. I like the boy. He's a good preacher, nice fella. I'm talking about my friend in Houston. Y'all know the fella? Joel Osteen. Joel is a nice guy. Big church. Every preacher wish he had one. But most of his messages are to help you feel good. There's no standard of preaching. There's no conviction to live anything. It's just to make you feel. And I know he's some of y'all best friend. Y'all like, I can tell how y'all looking at me like, I dare him. I da- oh my God. <laughs> now, <laughs> some of y'all looking at me like you want to jump on me right now. I said I like the fella. <laughs> I like him. But, but if you're looking for conviction in his sermon, you're not going to get it. It's to make you feel good. Here's the problem with feel good stuff. Feel good stuff will meet your appetite, but it won't make you produce anything. So after I'm through feeling good, I don't have the tenacity or the depth of truth to help me fight through the warfare that goes on in my house. I feel good, but I can't cast out a devil. I feel good. Okay, let me let me talk to this side. I, I feel good, but I don't have the power to deal with stuff that goes on around me with spirits. So it meets my appetite and it makes me feel good, but then I don't have any power when I'm done. The only power I am left with is self-power. I'm left with self-power. 
Again, selfish. Again, just the only person of interest is who? Me. The danger of apathy. Watch this. Many of us have, at some point in our lives, come into contact with what? That foul beast called apathy. And most of us can confuse it with, with depression. So stay with me. When we find ourselves trapped in clutches, in its clutches, we simply don't care enough to fight back. You feel a certain way, and you know you need to fight, but you don't fight it. You want to overcome this, but you don't do nothing to overcome it. You don't like the way you feel, but you'll just settle for the way you feel, because after all, it ain't that bad. Okay, I'm a, I'm, you don't have to say nothing to me. I know I'm talking to you. It's when I know I need to fight, but I don't have the energy to fight. I need to make some decisions to do something different in my life, but I don't have the courage to do something different because it would cost me to make decisions that may not make me so likable. And so I'm just stuck. Say it, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. And the way I cope is I find stuff I like to do versus use the energy toward the stuff I need to do. That's how you know you're not depressed. You still got energy. See, depression and apathy is a lack of passion. It's a lack of energy. It's a lack of emotion. Depression is a real energy, a real emotion that's turned inside. See, it's, it's really the truth of the matter. If you're depressed, your real problem is you're angry about something you don't have control over. And if you could fix it, you would fix it, but you don't have the ability to fix it. And so rather than feel sorry for yourself, you have turned it inwardly and now you're angry. Because you feel like part of the reason you're here are your own choices and mistakes. Come on. And so I can't do anything about it. And because I can't do anything about it, this thing is now turned inside. And now I feel like, oh, it's me. I want to lay in bed and I don't want to get up. All I want to do is eat and sleep. I don't want to talk to nobody. I want to keep the room dark. Let me talk to this side. I, I'm, I'm, I'm calling it depression. Uh, help me, Holy Ghost. But this lack of passion this is not depression this is apathy where I don't have the energy to do see, 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 see depression leaves you with no energy for anything you're just doing enough to get by and what you do you do to entertain yourself so you're depressed you'll go to a movie but you won't go to church because church will bring about responsibility when you're depressed you don't want responsibility God help me when when but apathy is the absence of the emotion it is the suppression of any feeling and any emotion when you when you don't have the energy to do what you don't what you don't what you know you need to do but won't do but have the energy to do anything else so now watch this we're content to remain trapped with no motivation to drive to, or, or drive to overcome um, or to replace it that is to replace responsibility with slowfulness we, we have no drive to do it so we just kind of live with things the way they are when or how does it originate where did apathy come from it's not depression it is a matter of being bored with no motivation to do anything productive it comes from one or seven things. Now, you're going to read these seven things with me. Amen. You ready? Yeah. Now, let's read these things. You ready? Yeah. Read. The absence of pure protocol. People get frustrated and apathy sets in when people don't know what the order of things are. Well, uh -huh. All right. I mean, I thought I knew uh -huh. what the order was, uh -huh. but I'm confused because I don't know who in charge this week. Well... <laughs> I don't know the protocol. Number two, there's no empowerment for assignments. Apathy sets in a church when people have responsibility but no real authority. Because what's the point of giving me responsibility if I have no authority to carry it out? And if I do carry it out, I'm in deep trouble. So you give me an assignment with no empowerment to actually carry it out, what sets in? Apathy. 
Because people don't like, uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know how that got on the screen. It ain't on my computer, though. Oh, uh, that's my boat. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a nice little boat. It sails on the water. Come fix that. Come fix it. Somebody fix it. Thank you. That's my little, that's my little thing. Y'all get to see my boat. That's how I get over my apathy. <laughs> All right. Can you find it? Yep, find it. All right. Well, I got it here while you're talking. You may have to write it down until it comes back on the screen. You ready? But no empowerment for assignment. Here's number three. You don't have clear goals. When goals are not clear, we have, we have, we have a mission, we have a name, but we don't know what the goals are. Tell me we're supposed to do something, but I don't know what the goal is. When I don't have goals, it doesn't matter if it's church, business, when I don't have goals, what's that in? Apathy. Most of us live life by whatever the day bring. On Mondays, this is what I do. On Tuesdays, I'm going to do whatever is available for me to do. On Thursday, it's just what it is. On Friday, it is what it is. I know I might go to church on Sunday, but I have no real goals. I'm not going to school. I'm trying not, not trying to get a trade. I ain't trying to make no money. I'm just going to borrow $20 this week from my brother and 20 next week from my cousin. Let me talk back to this side. Uh, all I need to make sure is I got gas and I'm good. <laughs> Some of y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. I know, but you think I've been in your house. I haven't been there. I haven't been there. When you don't have clear goals, this is personal. This isn't even, this isn't even my church. This is just personal. When you don't have clear goals, I'm 45 and don't know what I'm going to do. What's that saying? Apathy. Number four. Number four. Read it. You got goals, but they're not the right ones. You have goals, but they're not yours. You're following somebody else's goal and passion. You're trying to keep up with a friend of yours, and because they decided to do it, they decided they're going into travel agency business, and it's a passion for them, and you just figure you could stand a check, and you want that free cruise, you can go on, so I'm going to do this too, but you don't really have no goal. Why am I talking to you about that? It ain't you? Okay. All right. <laughs> You, you're working on goals that's not yours. You picked up somebody else's dream and wonder why you don't succeed like they do. It's not your goal. Therefore, you don't have the passion to see it through. What's going to set in? Apathy. You would have paid for all these books to help you do the business and haven't picked up one to actually get it done. You probably, got, you probably got about five or six different books in your house for different businesses that you didn't paid money for, borrowing $20 from your brother this week and your cousin the week after you didn't pay for. <laughs> you ain't done <nothing> with. <laughs> Y'all don't laugh at me. Number five, what does it say? The very origin of apathy is what? A loss of focus on God's plan. When you're not connected to who God called you to be, you're not connected to what God called you to do. You just, by my mama say, my mama say, just flying by the seat of your pants. You have no idea of your real assignment. I'm, I'm, you're in church, but you don't know what your assignment is in the kingdom of God. I don't know who I'm supposed to be. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what my ministry or my purpose is. That's a dangerous place to be. How many of you would employ a person in your business if you had one that you took care of, paid, made sure they ate and everything, and they came to work every day saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to do? How many of you would do it? Let me see your hand. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let me see your hand. I said, come on. Let me see your hand. None of you would, and yet you expect God to do it every day. Every day you want God to take care of you, but you don't know what you're supposed to do on the job. Every day you want God to feed you, but you don't know what you're supposed to do on the job. 
every day you want God to get you up with mercy and grace but you don't have a clue of what you're supposed to do on the job and yet you want God to keep taking care of you and wonder why things just keep sliding through the cracks God is a steward I got nobody talking God is a steward and he doesn't waste what he has nor does he find pleasure in anyone who does I'm going to talk good, you know. I'm, I'm, not going, I'm just going to quit looking for you to respond. Number six, what is it? Too many things incomplete. Apathy sets in when you start a lot of stuff and don't finish it. You, I'll say it again. Apathy sets in when you start a lot of stuff and don't finish it. Want me to say it again? When you got too many things incomplete, you start and never finish. Apathy sets in when you're inconsistent. And so when you got an organization like this and you start stuff and are not consistent, apathy sets in. People don't know what to do. They don't know if we're meeting this week or if we're not. We don't know what we're supposed to do this month. Apathy sets in. And then it gets real easy to become frustrated because nobody's doing anything. They're not doing anything. They don't know what to do. Apathy will set in because we have too many things we start and don't see through. Let me just ask a question. You don't, you don't have, listen, this is not for you, this is for the person sitting next to you, okay? Answer for the person next to you. How many of you, get, you sitting next to the person that you know got some stuff they start and, and haven't finished? You sitting next to them. Don't be scared to raise your hand. You raising your hand for him. I saw you, that's right. <laughs> Baron raising his hand for you. He's saying you started some stuff and didn't finish. <laughs> you, for your whole row, bishop included. <laughs> okay, I'll say, he on your roll. <laughs> he, he on your roll, man. Okay, all right. <laughs> I ain't trying to get him in trouble. He said that. He said that. He said that. <laughs> he said that. Don't be scared now, man. Too many things incomplete. Number seven, we read, we distance ourselves from him and what matters to him. Which can be the result of offense. A lack of confidence in direction. A loss of focus and distraction. And on a spiritual plane, a lack of faith. And lastly, fatigue. When apathy is at work, this happens. When apathy is, man, you're going to make me say everything again. When apathy happens, when it exists, this happens. <laughs> It happens. This happens. And so here we are. Here we are. Here we are thinking because we're at church, we're on God's plan. Because you gathered, you're focused on God. Let's just tell the truth. Part of the reason the spirit of offense exists, and it's one of the things I felt when I walked in. You ain't got to like it. I didn't come here to lie. One of the things I felt was a spirit of offense, broken hearts, people not knowing what to do emotionally and mentally, frustrated. Part of it is because what has happened is apathy has released the spirit of offense. And so some people are talking to people in ways you would never talk to people. You say something to me, I'm subject to cut you off. I don't mean no harm. I don't mean no disrespect. I don't mean to cut you off. I really do love you, but I'm dealing with some stuff. That's the way we answer. Oh, it's quiet in the room. I just, it's quiet in the room. The spirit of offense will set in and it will tear church up. I don't care how good the preacher is. I don't care how good the music is. Y'all ain't got to talk to me. I don't care how, how orderly it seems. The spirit of offense, when it sets in, it is a dangerous spirit and it comes because of the spirit of apathy. And you may be sitting here saying to yourself, ain't nobody offended. You have asked nobody. And if you asked them, they probably wouldn't tell you the truth because they don't want to hurt your feelings and they don't want to have to be accountable for what they are. I didn't come to play. Let's just be clear about that. I laugh a lot and I joke a lot, but I'm not playing. Do you understand? What is the power of apathy? Revelation chapter 316. Come on. What does it say? 
So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm comes from the word clearis. Look at the word clearis here in the Hebrew. It's a metaphor. What does it mean? It's the condition of the soul wretchedly fluctuating between torpor and fervor of love. Now you probably what is that word? <laughs> what is that word? He misspelled it. No, I didn't. Look it up. The word torpor is when there is no mental activity. So you go from, watch this, here's the difference between the two. This is a lack of mental activity, and this is intense passion. In other words, you caught between two states. <laughs> Today you love it, tomorrow you hate it. You're caught in two states. I really love this, and I'm committed to it, but I don't have no energy for it. I really love this church. I love my pastor, but I don't have no energy for it. I really love my church. I love what it stands for. But I don't have the passion to do the things that I need to do. Therefore, I got to be fussed at to do it. I got to be made to do it. And honestly, it's not coming off the way it should. I don't even need an amen. Sit quiet like you're doing. Except for you. Tell me to say it again. He says you're lukewarm. That word lukewarm means, it doesn't mean that you, watch this, it doesn't mean that you are neither hot nor cold. The word lukewarm means you are fluctuating between emotion and no emotion. That's what lukewarm means. It doesn't mean you're not hot or cold. It means that you are schizophrenic. I ain't got nobody talking. You, you sitting in church, what looks like the Holy Ghost is really you being bipolar. Ain't nobody got to talk to me. Uh, Y'all, you ain't got to like me. Let me just talk to you like I know how to talk. That I got what looks like the Holy Ghost, but not according to power. I got energy, but no real drive. I got love, but no real commitment. So I'm sitting in a seat because I know if I'm not here, somebody going to call me. But the truth is, I don't really want to be here. Not today, Jesus. That thing is called apathy. And you can sing and be apathetic. You can preach. There are a lot of preachers preaching that don't feel like preaching. They preaching and don't give a foot about the people they preaching to. Just give me my money when I'm done and let me go. And don't y'all call me, call somebody else. <laughs> Let me talk to this side. There are a lot of people in church who are doing church but don't care about people in church. Look down your road right quick. Say, you know, you know. Say, you know. You know. Say, you know. You know somebody like that. Why well, ain't saying it's you? You know, you know somebody like that. We know it's not you. You love Jesus and you love his people. But you know some people. Let's just be honest. Some of you sitting here tonight. You love the Lord, you say. But you know the truth be told, you have said in some private conversations, you don't want to be bothered with nobody at this church. So when you're done, you out the door and you're gone. I'm one and done, Rev. <laughs> Wrong side. I'm going to sing and go home. I'm not going to participate in no other ministries. Don't ask me. Because I don't want to deal with nobody. Touch your neighbor and say, don't point at me, don't point at me. Say, don't point at me. Don't point at me. That wasn't me. <laughs> that wasn't me. I'm doing enough to get by. I want you to hear me. I'm, I want you to laugh with me. I want you to be here and connect with me because I want you to be able to receive this. You understand? This is my style of delivery. I pull people in to what I'm doing. Got it? Got it? All right. Looking at me like you mad. <laughs> y'all make sure y'all get me out the back door when I'm done. <laughs> All right. What does it say? Zephaniah 1, 12 and 3. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come on. The Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. 
Their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. And though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from the Lord says, I, I, can't, I can't deal with your complacency. I will have to punish your complacency. Another word for apathy. Look down your road right quick. Tell the person next to you and say, let's change this. You can't be complacent. Let's change this right now. Let's change this right now. We can't be complacent. Let's change this right now. Can't be complacent. Say it. Let's change this right now. Can't be complacent. Because the word, not Gary Scott, the word says, if you are complacent, if you are apathetic, that you will build houses you won't live in. You'll plant vineyards, you'll own them, but you'll never drink wine from them. In other words, nothing you have will you get to enjoy. So on top of having suppressed passion and suppressed emotion, I'm really going to be depressed because ain't nothing else working. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Yes. Touch the person next to you and say, that's a compound. That's a compound. We don't need a compound. So if I'm not serious about what God's work is, why does God need to be concerned about what my work is? You want him to care about your stuff, but you don't want to care about his. I believe it's in the Bible. He says, you have built sealed houses. You have built your houses while my tabernacle has laid waste. Talk to me if I'm in the book. Why? Because God is not a stranger to the complacency and the apathy that sometimes arrests men when it comes to his affair. Let me tell you ultimately what God wants. He doesn't want you to just become busy. He wants you to fall back in love with him. I need, I need you to find two people say, let's not get it twisted. He ain't talking about you getting busy. He's talking about you falling in love again. Because if you love me, I ain't got to ask you to do nothing. If you love me, I ain't got to beg you to do nothing. If you love me. That's the message to the church. I know you. You used to love me. Now, I, I need to say this. This is for free. This is for free. I need to say this. That most churches don't understand why pastors struggle. Pastors struggle. And sometimes, if you like Bishop Young, you look good doing it. But let's just be real. Sometimes you have struggles when it comes to people in church. But he makes it look good. I mean, he looked good after all. But the truth is, men and women of God have to live whatever God is feeling. Let me say that again. Men and women of God have to live what God is feeling. Come here, Hosea. You didn't choose a prostitute. I chose her for you. And I made you marry this woman who keep running to other men's houses that you got to go get her out of and bring her back home. Why would you do that to me? Because I want you to know Hosea so you could accurately prophesy my heart what it feels like to have a wife that keeps going after other men. Because Israel keep going after other gods. And I want you to know how that feels. I want you to know it so that when you talk about how I feel, you'll really know what you're talking about. In order for you to accurately depict my heart, you got to live it. So I'll make you live it even though you didn't ask for it. Just so that when you preach, you're accurate when you preach it. Who asks for that kind of life? I said, who asks for that kind of life? Say it again. Who would ask? Nobody in their right mind would say, God, let me live what you feel. Come here, Jonah. We talked about him this morning. You remember God sending him to the people to prophesy to the people that he was going to spank them, whoop them? Okay, y'all deep. And the Bible says, and after God gave him the word, he made him sit down. He fell in love with a gourd that grew up overnight. He had a plant that grew up overnight. And the Bible says, and he fell in love with it. Woke up the next morning, it was dead. 
and he cried over it and asked God why would he do it and God says wait a minute I need I want you to understand you didn't plant that you you didn't do nothing to make that grow and if you could fall in love with something you didn't invest in how much more am I to be in love with the people I created I let you fall in love with it so you would understand by the next morning what it feels like to change my heart. I changed my heart because I was in love with the people. I ain't got nobody talking. And I let you fall in love with something you had no investment in so you'd understand my heart rather than complain. I don't feel like preaching tonight. But men and women of God have to live it in order to accurately depict it. So when you hear statements like Bishop made this morning, I'm there for you. I just need you to... See, some of y'all heard it. I waited on y'all. So I've been there for you. I really just need you to be there for, for me. When you hear statements like that, he's crying out for your help. Why does he cry out for your help? Because he fills the void. He fills it. He has to live something you will never understand because God doesn't make you have to live it in order to preach it. To you, he just talking too much. To you, he just got up to say something when in truth, he's trying to convey to you a heart you probably wouldn't understand unless you had to live it. One of my sons told me, bless his heart, told me, when I start pastoring, I ain't going to pastor like you. I said, okay. <laughs> Dummy. <laughs> he said, I'm going to do a whole lot of stuff different than the way you do it. I see the stuff you do. I don't know why you make some of the decisions you make. I said, okay. <laughs> Dummy. <laughs> Two years into pastoring, he came back to say to me, Pop, you know what? I find myself doing some of the same stuff making some of the same decisions and I'm sorry I didn't understand why you made the decisions you made but after having to do it now I understand you never know unless you're having to live that life God help me huh okay so where are you going where are you going pastor I'm, I'm glad you asked what does it say what is the power of apathy look at it things in our lives can get misplaced when we are not clear about the power of apathy when often we, we often uh, when I say miscalculate the appropriate responses when we are under the power of apathy we don't make the right decisions the natural but unnatural response to the need to reconnect is often met with the choice of escape now, I'm going to explain that in a minute when we can't seem to pick up the pieces and reconnect or re-engage we take long sabbaticals y'all know that term don't you we we'll take long sabbaticals, prematurely abandoning our assignments. What did he just say? That when apathy hits us, here's how we usually handle it. I need a break. <laughs> I don't want to do nothing. And if you're not a responsible saint, you'll just take one without talking to anybody. <laughs> yeah, you're not resp- you know, you just decide for six Sundays you ain't coming to church. I said six, that's what I said. Six Sundays, you ain't coming to church. (laughs) You ain't coming. You just gonna call somebody and tell them, lay the envelopes out on the back row so everybody can get them and uh, put the prayer cloths under the seats so people can pick them up. I ain't coming today. Y'all ain't got got to like me. <laughs> you six weeks, you just and then finally, finally, when somebody do get you on the phone, you finally you get a number you don't know, <laughs> and it's somebody from the church. And that where you been? I just, I just needed to take a sabbatical. <laughs> Act like y'all ain't never heard the word. This side ain't said nothing. All this, this is the only side I talked to him. Y'all ain't never heard the word sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> I need to take a sabbatical here's the problem here's the problem you take sabbaticals you quit you lay down on your assignments you prematurely abandon your assignments leaving nobody responsible not understanding that your need to escape while you're trying to reconnect you escape and don't realize you're affecting somebody else let's read it the problem with this is we do so without what counting the cost of selfishness how it affects not only ourselves but how it affects others so in short sightedness 
and our inability to see past ourselves, we disconnect. And that disconnect perpetrate, uh, perpetuates and becomes contagious. So you took a sabbatical, left somebody else ill prepared to carry out your assignment. They got fed up and tired and said to themselves, if you can do it, I can do it too. I ain't got nobody talking. If you can be gone and ain't nobody saying nothing to you, then I can be gone too. You ain't finna stick me with this boo-boo. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Talk to me. And so now you took a sabbatical. They feel like because you took one and nobody whipped you, then they're going to take a sabbatical. And before you know it, there ain't but one usher at church. <laughs> Why he pick on the ushers? <laughs> one greeter, one deacon, one finance person. Pick the one. I don't care which one you pick. It becomes contagious. Because you don't think about how your decision affects other people. And you're not thinking it because apathy has you so engaged with the need to reconnect that you completely disconnect. You don't know how to re-engage. So then this just becomes the mode of operation. Everybody starts doing their own thing. And nothing is working the way it should. And I said this yesterday, money is the byproduct of excellence. When you don't have people functioning in excellence the way they should, everything falls. Finances fall, which means then we can't hire all the people we need to hire to keep ministry running the way we need to keep ministry running. So you overwork the people who are working. They get burned out and tired, and now they need a sabbatical. I ain't got nobody talking. <laughs> Somebody help me tonight, please. And so then we, what happens? So then we got to raise extra orphans to make up for what, what actually just started because you lost passion. You never thought being out of place affected others in their place. And because of this disconnect, others seek to escape as their solution. The unfortunate thing is, everybody don't know how to come back. Some people take sabbaticals and never come back. They took a sabbatical. They didn't quit church. They just went visit other churches where they didn't have no responsibility. And it felt real good sitting in the back of the church when they didn't have nothing to do. Church over, we gone. Y'all, okay, this side ain't saying nothing to me. They, 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 they went other places with no intention to stay. They went with intentions to just escape, got there, and liked the fact that they didn't have to do nothing. And nobody was going to hold them accountable. And so they stayed. But they still love y'all because they watch everything you do. They catch you on stream. They catch you. They on live. They trying to see what y'all doing next week. They calling everybody. Ooh, y'all had good church today. Ooh, that's my church. But they at somebody else's church. <laughs> Bishop Young, that's my pastor. But they at somebody else's church. Foolishness. Because they don't know how to reconnect. Am I talking too much? Come on. And what follows, read. Is the crumbling of essential entities, necessary relationships, valuable institutions, finances, and homes. According to Zephaniah, nothing will seem to work or produce because apathy gets in. Nothing works. Nothing works. We try. We do what we could. How is it that I make the same money, I have the same bills, but I'm short when I wasn't short before? I got the same money, I got the same bills. Six months ago, I was good. The last six months, it's been tight. But I got the same money with the same bills. Y'all don't want to talk to me. You know why that happens? That happens because apathy set in and you lost passion for what was real. If you're not going to take care of God, why you got to take care of you? Seek first. Let's see if I'm in the Bible. Seek first my way of doing things. That's the kingdom. And what does he say he'll do? He said he'll add. You ain't got to seek it. 
the first verse. You don't have to seek it like Gentiles do. If you do my things my way, then I'll add to you. The reason you experience subtraction is because you lost passion for the things that belong to him. And parenthetically, let me just throw this out. Husband and wives who find themselves in disagreement, husband and wives who find themselves not in alignment will also experience the same thing. If you pay attention to it. If you're married and you and your, your husband or your wife are not in alignment, you can make the same money with the same bills and your money won't stretch. The moment y'all come back together, everything else comes back together. That was for free. Moving on. <laughs> Revelation 3 and 2. What does it say? Wake up. Strengthen what remains. I need you to find two people right quick and tell them that's what we need to do right now. We need to wake up and strengthen what remains. There are a lot of things out of place, a lot of people out of place. There are a lot of people that are in places. A lot of people are out of places that used to be in places. Y'all ain't talking to your neighbor. There are a lot of people that are not where they're supposed to be, have taken sabbaticals permanently. Y'all ain't gonna talk. Their feelings hurt, they gone, they ain't here. But the Holy Ghost said, tell you tonight, strengthen what remains. Don't cry over who's gone. Don't cry over who left. Don't cry over what's not being done. I ain't got nobody talking. And the people that you got, appreciate them, love them, respect them, and strengthen what remains. I need you to find two people and say, this ain't going to work if I keep getting overlooked. This ain't going to work. Keep overlooking me. Keep underappreciating me. This ain't going to work. Come on. What does he say? Strengthen Revelation 3 and 2. I'm all Bible. You understand? Revelation 3 and 2 says what? Wake up. Strengthen what remains. And it is about to die. Whatever's about to die, I need you to get it back on, on life support and get it back on its feet. Y'all ain't talking. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. You ain't finished. Look at two people say, you're not finished. You're not finished. I know you, the devil want to make you feel like you are. Make you want to feel like maybe it's time to pick up and go somewhere else and do something else. But you're not finished. I know I'm talking to somebody in here. Find somebody and tell them you're not finished. Put your sabbatical on hold. Give up that thought of quitting because you're not finished. The only way God going to promote you is you got to be faithful to his. Preach Holy Ghost. I said I wasn't going to preach, didn't I? So what do you say? Come on, Proverbs 15. What do you say? The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. Can you imagine what it is to be, a, to be uh, in a hedge of thorns? <clears throat> Everywhere you turn, you're pricked. <laughs> you go left, you're hurting. You go right, you're hurting. You back up, you're hurting. Try to go forward, you're hurting. The way of a sluggard. If, you, if, if apathy has set in, everything you try to do is just going to make things worse. So what is he trying to do? He's trying to get you, watch this, let's not be confused. He ain't trying to get you busy. He's trying to get you to fall back in love. I ain't got nobody talking. Because yeah. yeah. why? If you fall back in love, I won't have to talk to you about being busy. You'll do anything for me. Amen. I ain't got nobody to talk to. You'll do anything. I, you'll do it and I won't even have to ask you. If I can just get you to fall back in love. That's what the issue was with the church of Laodicea. They stopped being in love. He said your love is cold. He said to the church of Asia Minor, I need you to return to your first love. What was he after? You just falling back in love with him again. I need you to touch three people. I'm going to cut this short. Find three people and say, I'm going to need you to get your passion for him back. I, I need you to start reaching out for him. I need you to start stretching your hands out to the Lord. I need you to start asking him to come back. Ask him to detach you from everything that separates you from him. And tell him, I want you more than anything. Tell him, I want you. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. He wants you in love again. Because if you're in love, I ain't got to beg you for nothing. 
And it, and it works both ways. Because if he don't have to beg you for nothing, you ain't going to have to beg him for nothing. Ah! I wish somebody could hear me. The stuff you cry over, the pain you cry over, the hurt, the disappointment, the frustration, the sadness in your heart. All of that will dissipate if you'll just fall in love again. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm trying to quit. I'm trying though. First Thessalonians chapter 5, what does it say? Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Come on, read. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. No, what, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, that means when the Lord chooses to visit you, it'll come to you like what? The thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers. For that day to surprise you like a thief. It'll come upon them and they won't know what happened. But that's not going to happen to you. I wish you'd talk to the person next to you. Tell them that's not going to happen to you. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Which means that if I can just get you back in love with me, if I can get you back in love with me, nothing's going to sneak up on you. If you can just fall back in love with me, I'll give you a heads up before it gets to your house. If you fall back in love with me, it won't get to your house. You'll block it before it gets there. If you fall back in love with me, I'll turn it around before it turns upside down. If you fall back me God God help me because he wants to reveal the secret things to you he wants you to know secret things nothing has any business sneaking up on you sickness don't have no business sneaking up on you lack I wish y'all would help me talk tonight has no business sneaking up on us depression has no business sneaking up on us happiness has no business Sneaking upon us. Because I'm a child of the light. And can't nothing come in my territory without me seeing it. I'll see it beforehand. I'll know how to pray before it get here. I'll be driving in my car. And I'll start praying in the Holy Ghost and turn it while it's being devised. I'll turn it before it even leaves the place of its origin. I'll start praying in the Holy Ghost and turn it before it ever happened. Ain't got nobody talking to me. This is not supposed to sneak up on you. Can I go on and finish? Yeah. I don't know how. I'm tired. Um, I think I got, oh Lord, I got three more. You want me to do the last three or I can stop right here? Gonna do the three? What you say, man of God? Gonna do the three? Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so then watch this here. Let me read some water so I can catch my breath or something. I didn't got all excited and everything. It's 31 years, y'all. I ain't, I ain't as young as I look, you understand? So watch this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. What does it say? Be what? Uh-huh. Be strong in the Lord. Come on. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But against what? Come on, you know it. Cosmic powers over the present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. There are spirits that want to operate in places that are illegal for them to operate in. Did you know that it is illegal for a spirit? To operate in open atmosphere? Did you know that? Listen, when one person gets sick, that's understandable. When three people get sick with the same thing at the same time, that's not coincidence. Oh, y'all. <laughs> God help me. You got to learn. To watch for signals and signs. 
when two or more experience the same thing at the same time it is a sign that a spirit is in operation God help me in here and those of you who are the sons and the daughters of God need to know that any spirit that chooses to operate boldly in an atmosphere that don't belong to him you have the right to dismiss it every place you find a demon working in the Bible he was working in a place where nobody who was alive wanted to be y'all ain't got me that's right. so then where were they they were in a graveyard found a man who was bound with many spirits come on talk to me and in the graveyard they were trying to kill the boy talk to me every place a demon was at work he was trying to hide because he knows he has no place in open atmosphere this realm only belongs to man. Did you hear what I said? I said this realm only belongs to man. For God to exist in this realm, he needed to follow a protocol. He needed a Mary to give birth. Y'all ain't talking to me. To God in the flesh. Because according to the Bible, God is spirit. I ain't got nobody talking. And the only way he could invade his own creation was he had to follow a protocol. Spirits don't have no business in this our territory. And from the time he created man, he said to man, I, I've created you in my own likeness, in my own image. Now have dominion. Subdue. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. Have authority. Everything in this realm belongs to us. So no spirit has any business operating here. And when you get a spirit of apathy operating among you, that's telling you that something's out of order. Because they can only be where things are out of order. I need about 20 angry people to shout. You got to leave us. You got to go. You got to, you got to, you got to leave us. You got to go. You can't stay here. We're not going to let you be comfortable here. We're not going to let you be at peace here. This is no place for you. This is the place and the domain of my worship. This is where I lift my hands. This is where I lift my voice. This is where I praise my God. Somebody say it. This is my place. This is my place. Say it like you mean it. This is my place. This is my place. This is my place. It's mine. It's mine. Say it again. This is where I lift my hands. This is where I lift my voice. This is where I worship my God. This is where I make love to my God. This is where God makes love to me. Every mother and father in here, when you get ready to make love to each other, you shut the door. Especially if you got children. I ain't got nobody talking. So I said something funny. I said every mother and father in here got children. When you get ready to make love, you shut the door. I ain't got nobody talking. come on read with me read I got to go what does it say watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation the spirit indeed is willing but the what and again we went away and prayed saying the same words and again he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer and he came the third time said unto them are you still sleeping 
take up your rest. Listen, is it enough? It, it is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of the sinners. If we continue to allow apathy to go unchecked, it will allow power to be turned over into another's hands. You don't want your power in somebody else's hands? I need you to find 10 people. I'm almost done. Hang up with two more slides. Find 10 people and tell them we can't let our power be in somebody else's hands. We can't do that. Let's finish. What does it say? Second Samuel 11 and 1. What does it say? In the spring of the year, the time when, when kings go to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. That means he tarried or he remained still. The word Yashab, it means he eased himself. When David should have been at battle, he was at home comfortable. Now watch this. Because it was when he was comfortable that he also became open to the spirit of adultery. I got nobody talking to me. That's when he saw Bathsheba. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. That's when he decided from his roof he had to have another woman. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. Because he was in a place he didn't have no business being. When it's time to go to battle, you can't be nowhere comfortable. I ain't got nobody talking. I, I need you to find seven people and say it's going to be dangerous to be comfortable with this spirit. Because if you do, you're going to open the door to more spirits. You cannot be at ease when the spirit of apathy is roaming freely. Oh, you open the door to other spirits and they get worse. Yes. And they get worse. Yes. And they get worse. Yes. And they get worse. And they get worse. And it gets worse. Yes. Is that what you want for your church? No. Is that how you want to represent your God? No. Is that how you want God to see you? No. Of course not. And if you don't, then here, remember. Now that what? Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Whenever apathy is at work, there's going to always be a search for something else to fill your appetite. That's how David ended up seeing her. Come on, talk to me now. And what does it say? You got to remember, that is an invention, which means it's a falsehood. That which appeals to the appetite but does not satisfy. And so, watch this. Here's what happens. When you satisfy your appetite, but the appetite is not really satisfied, you need somebody else. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it starts with her, uh -huh. and because it didn't satisfy you, uh -huh. you got to get another. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> and, and because that don't satisfy, you got to get another. Y'all ain't talking to me. Good, good. And because that don't satisfy, you got to get another. Now, before we get real deep, some of y'all doing that with coffee. Say, what did he just say? Cough is supposed to keep you awake. You think it's supposed to keep you energetic. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. You're expecting the caffeine to keep you alert. But the reason you keep having to drink more coffee is because coffee is not a, is not a, 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 a stimulant. In truth, it is an anti, it's a depressant. That's why you gotta keep drinking more of it to stay awake. The more you drink, the more you gotta have. Y'all ain't talking to me. And just like coffee, you open the door to more stuff that you figure is satisfying something in your life when it's not. So let's just say, I ain't drinking coffee to stay awake. I'm drinking it because I like it. See, y'all don't even want to go there with me. 
Yeah, just gonna tell the truth. I ain't drinking it to stay awake. I'm drinking it because I like it. Put the it on the end. Put the t on the end. I like it. When the body does not move after a period of time, you have to learn how to do everything all over again. When apathy has set in and you have not been engaged the way you need to be engaged, you can't just pick up where you left off. After you've been still doing nothing for a period of time, you got to start all over, learning all over again. That's why you're timid about every step and decision you make. Okay, I'm gone. I said one more, didn't I? Here it is. How do I overcome apathy? How do I overcome it? Shoot. Is this the last one? Lord have mercy. Let me see. Because I was tired. How do I overcome? Okay, I got one more after this one. Is that okay? Yeah. This, this is the third one, but there's one more. There's a fourth. I said three, but that's four. Okay? Yeah. All right. So what does it say? As with all problems, apathy is what? It's surmountable. We can overcome apathy. We can overcome. Apathy is one of the characteristic responses of any living organism when it is subjected to stimuli too intense or too, uh, or too complicated to cope with. In Proverbs chapter 1 verse 79, what it says? It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Come on, read. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. What am I trying to say to you? Somewhere along the way, the human spirit, what? Consciously or unconsciously, has encountered more than it can process. How did I get here? Somewhere along the way, I've encountered more than I can process. You pushed me one time too many. You disappointed me one time too many. I've been left without instruction one time too many. I've been left to fend for myself one time too many and I can't process it no more. So I just so the best thing for me to do is what? Nothing. How do I overcome this thing? Somewhere along the way. Of course, the level of toleration differs from for different people. Right? So here we are, next to the last. James 1, 5, 7. What does it say? Let him what? Ask God that give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not and it shall be given him but let him ask in faith nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now I just need to pause here because the truth of the matter is if you are indecisive if you're teetering the line the scripture says, read that last line. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. It doesn't matter what it is you think you will do. You get nothing as long as your mind is not made up. I didn't write this. So I need you to look on your row and say, you're going to have to make up your mind that this is a spirit you ain't playing with. All too often, we forget that with God, all things are what? I'm sorry. All things are what? Possible. All things are possible. I don't know where I just went. Lord Jesus, let me give it there. There we go. All things are possible. Mark 10, 27. And I can do all things through Christ. What? Who strengthens me? Philippians 4, 13. But before we can utilize the strength to do the impossible, we must first ask our creator for it. Right? This is the way. This is the way. This way we remain conscious of, of where our help and our deliverance comes from. Not from ourselves, but from God. So what do we do? Here's how we do it. Here's how I can overcome apathy. Are you ready? How do I overcome apathy? Number one. It should be number one, though it says, it says, though it says number two. Because number one is make the decision. Number two is what? Consider the point of disconnect. The cure for apathy is comprehension what did I say it's comprehension if you are able to think back to when your apathy started try to find out if it started after you felt the situation that you were facing was too intense or complicated or before you have to trace it when did I disconnect 
Look down your road. Y'all, now you ain't talking. Ask the person, say, you got you to make the decision. You're not going to play with this. And then you have to ask yourself, when did this start? When did I start feeling like I had no passion for this? I'm here, but I don't really have passion for it. I'm doing it, but God knows I'd rather be somewhere else. Why is this important, Pastor? Because if you can't identify the place of disconnect, then it is possible that you repeat the same thing again. So if, if I got disconnected, Pastor, when I was, I don't know, when I found out that three or four people I went to church with was talking about me. Three or four. I found out they were talking about, I found out three or four laughed at my situation. I found out that there were people who really didn't care about me. If that's where it started, then go back there. Let me finish. What does it say? Number three. Get started. Once we realize that we need to be doing something, the next step is to go out and do it. Yes, it's easy. But the hardest part is the decision. I'm not going to live with this spirit. I'm not going to let it control my life. And force me to miss out on what God wants. Because at the end of the day, what does God want? Thank you, Jesus. What does he want? He wants us to fall in love with him again. So that his business becomes important to us again. And so if I make that decision and I can figure out where I got disconnected. Then the next thing for me to do is go back now. I got I, I to start here. I need to go to the people that, that may have offended me. I may, I may need to be honest with the person who's hurting me and don't know they're hurting me. Oh. So if you're not ready to be transparent, you're not ready for deliverance. I got some help in the back of the church. Is that an easy task when we don't have any real desire to? No, of course not. But if we wait until we care enough to do something, then we'll never do anything. See, you're already at the place where, whatever, I don't care. Kind of just apathetic. You can't wait till you start feeling it again. This has to be because you have decision. And the decision says, I got to do it. Not because you feel like doing it. Are y'all listening to me? Yes. So, 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 so what? So what does it say? What's it? We need to be the ones who break the cycle. Whether we have the motivation to do it or not. We have to pray to God for strength and then plow. Plow. Because you know that you can't afford for this spirit to continue to work. Come on, I'm trying to close with you. The way you do this is start with choosing how many things? Because you got enough stuff you haven't completed. You start with just choosing one thing that you like and or desire and then achieve doing it. What's the one thing you like? What's the one thing you love? Because I've lost passion, past. I've lost drive, I lost, I lost energy. But let's start with one thing you like and let's accomplish it. One thing that's meaningful. We ain't talking about going to the movies. I like going to the movies. That's easy for me to do. We ain't talking about the movies. I can't get no help in here. I like going skating. We ain't talking about skating. <laughs> I, I like to go fishing. We not talking about fishing. What, what's the one thing you love to do that's, that's real to your purpose? Start right there. Because it is more than likely one of the things that you have reneged on and have not been true to that God's called you to. Start there. And the last slide says this, just to prove that I'm done. Isha, Osha, Mosha. What does it say? I think that's the last one. Clap your hands. Yeah. Put your hands together. Please take that picture off. I don't need nobody looking at my boat. <laughs> I didn't mean for that. That's my screensaver. That's how it got on there. What are you saying to us, Pastor? I'm saying to you, that a dangerous spirit for the church. God will look at you and all your shouting and all your dancing and all your singing and all your praising and still say. But I want to spit you out of my mouth. But I praised for you. 
I danced for you and I sung for you, but I can't stand you in my mouth. And the reason I'm willing to, to do it is because what you're doing ain't really for me. This you just trying to cope when you don't really have the passion you ought to have. The one of the reasons is you put your mind and your eyes on the wrong person. If anybody else has been guilty of hurting your feelings and disappointing you, it's because you put too much faith in them. And God says, what I want for you to do is fall back in love with me. Now, my time is up. I know it's, it's late and it's time to go. You got to drive somewhere back here within 20, 25 miles. I got to drive four hours. And if I can stay with you this long, you can stay with me. Amen. What I want you to.